Right, so good morning people and welcome to the Women in HPC workshop at ISC 2016. So the theme of today's workshop is addressing the gender gap in the HPC community. So we have a packed program, particularly packed since uh, we're starting a little bit late. Um, so we have a range of different things. We have um, some invited talks, we have a panel session, um, we have, and we have two breakout sessions where groups of people are going to be getting together um, to brainstorm some ideas. So welcome here, and we'll start with um, one of the keynote talks. And I'm going to hand over to Tony Collis and Lorna Riviere, who are going to talk about methods that work. So evidence-based advice on diversifying the HPC <coughs> community. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's really good to see you all here. Um, this will be the first time that we've stood up here and I really try to give you advice. Up until now, in our Women in HPC workshops, we've really been trying to talk about what we've learned so far. But we think it's now time to share what we've learned in the literature we've read and the studies we've done. And let's start really kicking in the change to changing this community. So this talk, which is a joint effort by Lorna and I, is all about things that you can do realistically back in your home institution, back in any events you run. So I hope you, you learn a few new things today. So just to explain to you why you need to do this, I'm sure that because you're here in this room, you actually do believe that this is worth doing. But just in case you need a bit of explanation of why we in particular are looking at recruitment directly into our community rather than tiny little tots age eight or three or 10, um, we need to give you a bit of background about the problem we have right now. So, how many women are there? This is actually harder than it seems to get a handle on. We've been looking now for two years to try and actually figure out how many women are there in our community, in the whole of HPC. It's hard to do. What we know so far is that women make up no more than 20%. That is our upper, upper limit. So, less than a fifth of the HPC community is women. It is far more likely to be around 15, to, well, 10 to 15 percent. For example, SC15, 13 percent of those were women attendees. That is the oh, go for it, Brian. Program or uh, everything? That's everything, and I was about to explain that. Uh, it really is everything. The exhibit floor, the tech program. I'm working with uh, SC16's chair, John West, to get the breakdown by badge, and hopefully he's going to publish that soon, which would be fantastic, because we think that when you take out the exhibit show floor, that that number is far less. And for those of you who've been walking around the tech program this week, you may well see that the conference uh, track is far more white male. Sorry, I always have to say sorry to the white men in the room for singling you out, but is far more white male than the exhibit show floor. Um, one other note on that too. <coughs> Interestingly, with the SC attendees, the so-called younger attendees are a little bit more diverse when it comes to gender. So there's more uh, women in the doctoral showcase and those types of programs. Mm -hmm. And then just to give you a little bit, we, we have a fair number of conferences that we've gone and counted, which is not a perfect method, but you know we've gone and counted how many women are in the room. For PGAS, it was down at 5% in 2013. So you're talking that when you get to these niche areas, it's getting worse. But praise days, which is a very general one, this was praise days 15, I went along and I counted 17%. Just to compare, because a lot of people are like, but that's not our problem, that's computer science, that's the people that feed into us. No, it's not, it really is our problem. This is the HEFCA data, which is the higher education institutions, universities in the UK. This is the number of women, percentage of women employed at universities in the UK in particular subjects. Physics and astronomy, 17%. So okay, that's at the upper end of what we're seeing in supercomputing, HPC. But then we look at all the other subjects. Computer science, one of our key feed, is 22%. Okay, so we cannot blame our lack of women on the subjects that feed into us. We cannot, it is our responsibility. Don't get me wrong, we're not starting from a great baseline, but we are not attracting even the women that are there. One of the things that I'm seeing having, helping to run the UK National HPC service is that the biologists that join us are still predominantly men, even though biology is way more women now than it used to be. We are even the subjects that have women, we are not attracting them. So we need to own that. So hopefully you now think that this is worth considering further. 
So what can we do? Why do we need to do this? Business as usual is not working. What we are doing currently is not succeeding. We need to be radical. We need to change up what we're doing. It is not sufficient to say, I'm going to hire the best. We need to look at retention. Women are leaving tech faster than men across the world, it's particularly bad in Europe. We need to keep those women. We need to hold on to them. They have something to offer us that is incredibly good. So why, why are they leaving? We need to hold on. We need to do whatever it is to hold on to them. Recruitment, we need to look at our recruitment practices. And we'll come to all of this in a minute. We need to look at career prospects. One of the things that the UK is currently going through, I will say, and it's making the community uncomfortable, is what does it mean to be a research software engineer? These are people who are almost perpetual postdocs in our universities who are responsible for maintaining the research software in our community who are essential for our scientific breakthroughs. And yet they have no career path because they don't publish the papers unless the person who actually then does the science with that software is kind enough to add them to it. So they have struggled to bring in grants. They, they have no way of moving up the ranks. And who wants to be a postdoc at, at 55? Don't get me wrong, there are some, and hats off to them if it's because it's their passion. But many people will leave, and that is something our community has to face. We have to provide a career path for the people who are essential to maintaining our codes. Okay. We need to look at women's networks, like women in HPC, hiring practices, opportunities for advancement and promotion, which is what I've just been saying, role models, having people stand up on this stage who people in the room can say, I could be that person. They might be male, but we actually need women on the stage too. You need to empathize with the person. You need to see yourself in them. And if the only people you see are so different from you, you're not going to feel that you could succeed in our community. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> that, that is yeah. your bit. Go for you it. You look like you were on to something, though. No, no. I don't want to interrupt your you go. There. Okay, so what methods actually work? Um, like Tony said before, we've uh, gotten into this groove of presenting information to you all that has been either about our own research or about other studies, but um, a lot of times, you know, folks leave that workshop and they're like, well, well, now what do I do? Like, what can I actually do? Who do I talk to? What do I say? So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, and I kind of broke this up into five main points, and we'll, we'll go through what each of these mean, and we'll even have some little um, role playing going on here it's when we talk about some of the controversial stuff. So um, when we get to that, uh, we're going to save questions for the very end, just so you guys know. I know you might be tempted because some of them are, are juicy, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I want to save the questions to the end. That way we can actually get through the material, okay? So first off, um, we really need to open the discussion on diversity with our colleagues, whether that means you're in the process of hiring and you want to talk about that, or that means just you're trying to improve the culture of your organization. Um, again, we'll talk about that a little later. Next, you want to look at uh, the recruitment and selection processes for your organization um, or your project even. Maybe you're managing a lab, that kind of thing. Um, we want to invest in employee development and support. Many times, you know, you bring on um, new non-traditional employees, but then because they're not quite um, accustomed to working in that environment, they tend to fail uh, more frequently and then reinforce some of the biases. So we really need to support them. Um, moving on, reviewing uh, internal management and performance review processes. Um, there's a lot to say about that too and measure progress and success, success towards goals. So the first one, we really need to open the discussion on diversity. Um, this may be a little difficult, obviously, to do. What we're doing right now is kind of that, right? We're talking about diversity, we're talking about um, what are some of the reasons why you wanna do this, and it's really important to kind of go around the room um, we're not going to do that here, but when you're talking to your colleagues, to go around the room and ask them to articulate why they think diversity is important for their project, for their organization. Um, and be open-minded, right? And, and be willing to hear them out. Bring in a guest speaker when you do this, um, especially if you're in a particular group that you might expect to be hostile or you might expect to uh, maybe be misinformed, even if they're not hostile. Sometimes you have really well-meaning people who are misinformed and then they end up doing something that's more harmful than, than good. Um, so bringing a guest speaker, this could be someone from your HR department, this could be someone from, um, if you're on a university campus, bring in someone from the social scientist that specializes in this type of work. Um, and, and yeah, so you can move forward with that. 
What you might find, um, as I mentioned before, is that there, there might be some comments that are, are not um, productive to uh, diversity efforts in your, in your organization. So here's the part where Tony and I are going to do a little bit of role play, and I'm going to put up some quotes, and then uh, Tony, her alter ego, is going to <laughs> represent uh, some of the members on the committee, and then I'll provide some information as to why that's not true. So, okay. We have to focus on hiring the best. Yes, Tony, we do. You're right. We really, you know, we really need to focus on that. However, what does the best mean, right? We need to redefine what best is in a particular scenario. Oftentimes, best is status quo or best is what the majority is and what they represent. In reality, we need to redefine that. Oftentimes, you get to the end of a selection process and um, you, if you're not defining clearly what your criteria for best or excellence are, then once you get to that end, everybody kind of has their own criteria and that's when it really comes out. So for example, I might favor someone from my own university or I might favor someone from my own discipline instead of favoring a non-traditional candidate. So um, redefining what best is and making sure that that's clear to everyone. Recruiting women and minorities diminishes opportunities for white males. Oh my goodness, Tony. You know, this is really sad sometimes. <laughs> this comes up a lot. Uh, I, and my, mind you, these quotes are taken directly from uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison's uh, WISE chapter, Women in Science and Engineering, and they wrote a report on how to improve, it's called um, Recruiting for Excellence, how to improve their faculty hiring process. So these are all based on research, just so you know. But um, anyways, we know that 79% of faculty at universities, which is where this comes from, and also from the sciences, are male and white, so I don't think that they have less of an opportunity. <laughs> um, also, uh, we know that uh, actually when white men are sympathetic to diversity causes, uh, research shows that they're more likely to be hired. So that's kind of funny too. So the, the white male who's sympathetic to diversity is more likely to be hired than the underrepresented minority. But food for thought. Moving on. There are no women or minorities in our fields, or no qualified women or minorities. Yeah, we get this one. Yeah, we get this one a lot. So um, yes, there's obviously a small number. That's the definition of minority. However, uh, there are certainly qualified people. And this kind of goes back to the first idea of looking at what best is, right? So redefining what qualified means. And also what I mentioned before and what I'll get into a little bit later is training up your folks, um, your staff and your students and, and equipping them with the skills to be successful in your group. So when you redefine what, what is uh, best and what qualified means and the non-negotiables for the particular position that you're interested in, then think about, well, what can we actually teach this person to do in addition to that? So rethinking, you know, what do they need to walk in the door with and what can we, what can we provide for them? The scarcity of underrepresented groups in faculty and sciences means that few are available, those who are available in high demand and who can't compete. This one, I personally face this one all the time when I'm talking to um, student, student program committees when they're selecting you know, students to participate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about recruitment practices to increase your pool, but an interesting fact about this, they did a study on some prestigious Ford scholarship awardees and um, only 11%, and they're all minority, uh, only 11% of those were actually being bid on competitively, so having multiple offers for a job or, or what have you. So the majority of them are not in competitive bidding wars. And there was actually another really cool fact, I wrote it in here about that. It was a little shocking, let me see in my notes. Um, 54% uh, were not aggressively pursued for faculty positions, and they held postdoctoral research appointments for up to six years after finishing their program. So not only were they not recruited competitively for a short time, but for a long time. So it's important to um, yeah, go after those, those underrepresented candidates and don't just assume that you're in a bidding war. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to recruit or how to revamp your recruitment. Really, um, you gotta think outside the box, right? So developing an active and aggressive recruitment plan is something that probably most people say, but again, you don't really think outside the box. So uh, partnering with organizations like Women in HPC, uh, partnering with organizations that are, that are uh, cater to particular groups that you're interested in increasing in your organization or in your lab that you notice that you don't have very much representation from there. Um, also, don't count on your typical avenues for recruitment, for example, 
um, calling you know, your friends that you normally call isn't going to work. That's what the 20% problem here is referring to. Uh, an interesting study done by <laughs> totally informal, non-scientific, uh, this guy named Rick Clough from Google Ventures, he looked through his address book and he saw that on his, on his address book he, he had 79.7% male contacts and on his Twitter feed, it was like 79.9% male contacts. And so he's sympathetic to diversity issues. And he was thinking, well, if I only know about 20% women, then how am I even going to help this problem? And I actually care about this problem. So um, you know, avoid that. And by, by going out of your way, even when you don't have a job posting, even when you're not actively recruiting, to meet folks from underrepresented groups and just build up your network. Um, and then, again, discuss what excellence means for the position you're seeking to fill. We talked about that already. And dispense with some assumptions that may limit your efforts. So here we're going to do a little bit more role playing about these assumptions. Nora, why shouldn't, we shouldn't have to convince a person to apply. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this makes me laugh. I come from a research one institution. I'm from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I don't want to make them sound bad, but you know, oftentimes you could say things like, oh, this is a great school. Why wouldn't they want to work for us? They should come talk to us. We don't need to go out there. You know, we're busy. Wrong. <laughs> we need to go out there. Um, oftentimes, too, you know, if you don't look like the community that you're trying to recruit, you know, what's to say that they're going to feel comfortable walking up to you? I mean, would you feel comfortable walking up to their community, right, out of the blue if it was the other way around, if it was reversed? So kind of breaking some of those barriers and, um, uh, getting, getting past this is obviously important, but yeah. Any worthy candidate knows to look for job listings in place X? So this is um, often uh, really, uh, it will limit your, your ability to recruit some of these underrepresented candidates because, again, they're underrepresented. They might be in non-traditional fields. They might be um, coming from campuses that you don't typically recruit from, so they're not plugged into the networks that you would normally tap into or else you would have seen them most likely. So uh, investigating where those folks are going, uh, I would also recommend not just partnering with organizations like, like Women in HPC, but even attending some of the conferences for underrepresented minorities. In the states, we have lots like that. I mean, uh, here. we have things like the Gender Summit here. Okay. Um, in, in the States, we have things like uh, SHIP, so the S Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers. We have NSBE, National Society for Black Engineers, it, all kinds of things. And then, of course, the gender stuff. So reaching out um, beyond your, your normal groups is critical. Okay. Excellent, excellent applicants need the same credentials as the person leaving the position. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's really hard to read these and not laugh sometimes. But um, so the, the idea of, of replacing someone with a carbon copy, particularly in research, would be extremely frowned upon. So I think it's funny that still folks stay this sort of thing because naturally if you have a professor, for example, who's replaced by their student and they do the exact same thing, then they're not being innovative. They're not being, um, they're not really contributing to the scientific world, right, if they're doing the exact same thing. So, uh, if you want someone to contribute something new to your organization and continue to help it grow and expand, then you really shouldn't be replacing them with the, a carbon copy, the exact same type of person. So um, once hopefully you get through all these steps and you get some people in your door, uh, it's time to invest in their development and support. And um, it's important to provide technical training where there might be gaps, particularly for your non-traditional hires. Uh, to bring them up to speed and to avoid the reinforcement of uh, negative biases if, if and when they do fail. We don't expect them to fail. However, if you don't prepare them for success, then of course, like anybody would. So um, avoid that. Offer managerial training. We work in a field that is obviously extremely technical, extremely scientific, and folks don't typically get these managerial training or skills. And so when they encounter you know social situations human resources situations they don't really know how to respond in an appropriate way and um, that can also be really negative uh, contributing to a negative experience for not just your underrepresented minority staff but also your majority staff and as Tony was saying women are leaving the field at an alarming rate um, and most of that is because they have uh, unhealthy relationships with their manager so they don't you know people don't leave jobs they leave managers usually and so it's important to to build them up for, and, and equip them for success. Um, also support work-life balance for all employees and, and lead by example if you're in leadership. Um, 
and see what has an interesting report that was just updated in 2016 about the facts of women in, in technology and they say that women and men actually want the same thing so if you go through and you survey them you ask them is family important to you is work important to you whatever they respond similarly so this is not a women's issue this is an, a family issue this is an everybody issue um, and then avoid gender or color invisibility uh, another interesting study by the national done by the national academies of science um, in the, in the states, they looked at multicultural organizations versus colorblind organizations. And so a colorblind organization says, we're all the same, I'm going to treat you exact, exactly the same, and, and we're not going to acknowledge that we're different, we're just going to say that we're the same. <laughs> and, and they do that well-meaning, right? You can see how that would go down. Um, but uh, in reality, it's, it's suppressing you know, individual identity. So you need to encourage the fact that everyone's different, um, celebrate that, and, and um, Again, call default to, to celebrating multiculturalism over colorblindness. So next, you want to review um, internal management and performance review processes. So uh, these are some basic, basic tips, giving constructive feedback regularly. Don't do this annually. Do this regularly. Do this informally and formally. Um, provide your employees with growth opportunities and then also creative opportunities. So many women tend to leave uh, the workplace because I was saying the, their uh, negative relationships with their managers or supervisors, part of the things that contribute to that negative experience are that women aren't often given opportunities to, to develop a creative project or something like that. They're more um, kind of put into project management, so to speak, because there's this belief that they'll be at work from eight to six or nine to five or whatever, which if anybody's a project manager, that, you know that's not true to begin with. And then on top of that, um, you're not, you're not allowed to grow on your technical side. So um, not having that opportunity is obviously really negative. Um, and then identify the value in alternative activities or careers. There's something that we recognize in the literature called a minority tax. And so when you're a member of an underrepresented group, you are asked to participate in even things like this. And, and you know, this is a wonderful thing, right? To promote um, increased uh, awareness and support for minorities. However, when tenure and promotion time comes around, all those activities that you did, like outreach activities or your work on committees, what, what have you, it's not valued nearly as much as your other colleague who maybe spent more time writing publications, um, which is obviously valuable. But again, you need to redefine value, redefine excellence and success. And then avoid biased personality penalties. So when women exhibit masculine characteristics or they don't exhibit feminine characteristics enough, by masculine and feminine, I'm going to put air quotes there, um, <laughs> they're penalized uh, in the workplace. So, you know, a woman will, will be penalized for being aggressive, for example, um, whereas, and, and this goes the other way too, but more so for women. Um, so avoid that. You know, if a woman is being aggressive and it's good for the company, hey, reward that. Don't, don't say that's a bad thing because she's a woman. Um, and then measure progress and success towards your goals. So collect demographic data. If you want ideas about this, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you later. I'm actually an external evaluator. I'm an educator and I'm a CS person. But um, uh, yeah, ask me about that because that's different for every organization. And then implement or refine um, some solutions and then constantly use feedback to guide those processes, um, not just to define what the sol those solutions might be, but again, to refine them. Um, and then evaluate the social climate and compare across groups. This is where, again, you would call in someone like myself, although there are um, some instruments you could use online, although I, I would caution that. Uh, this is where you ask people, like, do you feel like you belong? Do you feel happy in your job? Are you satisfied? And then you disaggregate that by um, group. So you can disaggregate that by gender. You can disaggregate that by job title. You know, oftentimes we find that, that folks that are more technical versus um, the soft sciences. There's differing um, value and satisfaction among those groups. And then the last thing I would say about all of this is start at the beginning with this. I know I ended with this slide because a lot of times it's easier to, to explain it at the end. But really, you should be collecting this demographic data when the person walks in the door or even in the hiring process. Um, and, and again, constantly doing uh, something to measure or get feedback from your, from your staff. So. Okay, so I'm just going to give a little roundup of what you can do based on what we know for the HPC community. Um, first of all, become a Women in HPC partner organization. This applies to companies, universities, national labs, events, 
We actually have our first Women in HPC partner conference, Euro MPI in September in Edinburgh. We'll be partnering with Women in HPC to improve com um, diversity in that community, the MPI community. So if you're running an event or a conference, come and talk to us. We give you a bullet point list of things you might want to do to improve diversity. We work with you to collect the data because it's really important we collect data. Um, we know where our baseline is. So yeah, come and, come and speak to us about that. Um, businesses, labs, universities, set up a women's network. What were women in HPC to set up a women's network? So when you have, this particularly applies to big organizations I've been speaking to this week. They've got one woman in Europe and one woman in Australia and doing the same kind of thing, but they think they're on their own. You need to put those women in contact with each other so that they know they're not on their own. It seems somehow when you start out, like a lot of women are reluctant to do this, oh, I don't need to be seen without as women. But when you put them in contact with each other, they settle down, they're happier. There is, there is a need for us to meet a like-minded women in the way that I think the male community doesn't really comprehend until you walk into a room like this and you realize you're the only man in the room. There are actually several men in the room, which is fantastic. But I remember uh, a few years ago, a colleague of mine walking into our, one of our boffs and uh, the, he knew me and he walked out again until I turned up because he was like, wow, I was the only man in the room. So it is uncomfortable the first time you walk into a room that it's not like you. Put women in touch. Help us with women in HPC research. Tell us how many women are in your organization. You need to do this carefully, so come and talk to us about how to do it. Share what you do. What practices do you put in place? We're gonna have a panel and a breakout discussion on improving diversity. We need new ideas. We need to know what works for our community. Blog about what you do. Tell us. For the early career women in the room, we want to know about your science. We want to share that women are doing HPC. So blog for us. For those of you who are employers, blog about how you want to improve female representation and how you have done it, if you've done it, and what the challenges you're facing. Perhaps people aren't comfortable with what you're doing. We need to have this discussion, so blog for us. And we actually do have a jobs page. So if you have a job and you would like to attract more women to apply, we have a community of women that follow our blog and our newsletter. So come and talk to us about advertising your job. Spread the message. What you heard today, go out there and tell other people, one, that we exist, and two, that this is happening. Become a woman in HPC blogger. I pretty much just said that. Read about. Read about not just what women in HPC are doing, but all the stuff that Lorne has been talking about. There is lots of literature online that you can go and check out about how to improve diversity. We really just put our toe in the water here today. We all need to be better informed. I know that this is not what we specialize in. What we specialize in is what's been talked about in the rest of the conference this week. But this is just as important. Educate. Three key things that you must know about, and I will actually talk about these at Supercomputing, I hope. Unconscious bias and implicit bias. For those of you who came to the BOF earlier in the week, you will have heard about those. Stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. I'm not going to go into detail here, but those are key words that you need to know and learn about. And then sign up. Become a Women in HPC member. Join our community. This is for like-minded people, hopefully more than that, will encourage more and more people to join us, individuals and organizations. And one other thing I'm really, really excited to announce today is that Women in HPC will be launching a Distinguished Speakers List. So some of you may be aware of the ACM Distinguished Speakers List, which is a great resource if you're looking for speakers. But I have a lot of people come to Women in HPC and say, I need some suggestions of female speakers. And I have my own <coughs> network, but as we were talking about earlier, that's limited to the people you know. So part of the problem we all have, and I will tell you, I've had this organizing events is, I know I want more women on the stage, but you know what, I don't, I don't know enough women, or the women I've asked are too busy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull all the information we have. We're gonna be launching a way for you to nominate either yourself or other people you know to be on our list that will be publicly available. We will go to the individual and check that they're happy with that. We'll list their expertise, we'll list where they are uh, with a biography. So we will be asking for the community to give us input on that, and we hope that that builds over the next 12 months. So it's a really exciting thing for us to do, and I hope you can all contribute to that. So that's been a whistle-stop tour of what you might be able to do. We have 
we're, we're over time, but we've caught up a little bit, so that's good. So we can have like one or two questions, if anybody's got any questions at the moment. Uh, yeah. I have a question about the partnership, because now I'm myself a member of the organization. How could I get my university to become a member? Okay, so at the, at the moment, what you need to do is get in touch with me, and we're, we're drafting up an agreement. We're trying to do it institution by institution. We're hoping that as we get enough institutions on board, that we'll have set ways of doing this. For nonprofits and, and universities, it is free. And what we do is we encourage you to build your network. That's what it really means to be a women in HPC group. You then set up your own network, your own women in HPC network in your institution. Um, and you collect data and things like that. So you come and work with us. Uh, we give you a, a, a list of things that you might want to try and do, and we work together with you. For companies, it's a bit more complicated, but I can talk to people offline about that. Anyone else?